like imagine you run a business, you, you do run a business. So all of a sudden, you know, this event happens, everybody's supposed to have their statement. There's tons of social pressure to make your statement. If you don't make a statement, it's compelled, you know, say, oh, your business didn't say something about Black Lives Matter. So you have to say something one way or the other. So everybody's making a statement. Everybody's trying to do the thing, and they don't know what to do. So I hear from a lot of people that email me about um, the, at their job, what they talk to their boss, and the boss is like, well, we have to do something, and there's this. You know, there's this program, this anti-racism program. So we have to do something, and that's the thing. And we'll just take it up. And a lot of people are successfully pushing back on that and saying, look, there are other ways. We can actually do other diversity programs than this one. And when they realize that, you know, a lot of bosses are saying, oh, yeah, maybe we should think a little harder about this. So everybody's acting really fast, and it's, uh, there's a clear moral panic going on. So people are making bad decisions, and they're opening themselves up to a lot of future litigation. Like if you're actually having an official statement or policy of your company that says something like uh, that you believe that all white people are complicit in racism or are racists, then you've now called all your white employees racist. That's not good. That's probably discriminatory. But do you think you can actually sue someone for that? My point isn't whether or not you can. My point is that a whether lot of people are going to try. But I think that the courts are even siding towards being more woke because it's society's cultural shift some moved yes, in that direction. Some yes and some no, and that's there's a point to that. But on the other hand, for example, if you look at the Title IX cases where those mostly boys, but it wasn't always boys, got totally railroaded in kangaroo courts. They got accused of sexual misconduct. The university ends up expelling them or whatever, you know, the girl with a mattress or whatever that mm -hmm. happened. And then they're suing in civil court and they're almost all winning. Is that kid, did that kid, the mattress boy, did he sue? I don't know if he did specifically or not, but I do know that there have been a number of civil suits. That lady was bringing her mattress on the stage when she accepted her her diploma. I mean, it's performance art. Yeah. It's just performance art. It's it's really, like, we can't run the world on performance art, though. Yeah. What's really strange, too, is that if you accuse someone of something and it turns out to not be true, you don't really get in trouble for that. That's, that's a thing. That's a real problem. That's a thing. Because there's no actual repercussions for being deceptive and ruining someone's life. I, I have a friend who was accused of sexual assault by a woman and it was proven that he didn't do it and nothing ever happened to her. That's, that's, he you just see, made some stuff up about him and. So we got laws against revenge porn, right? Like yeah. you can't like film your girlfriend or whatever and then you break up and then you put it on her, put her on the internet to put her on blast or embarrass her or whatever. Right. It's against the law now. We made laws about that. I mean, this doxing stuff or these videos where they're filming people and accusing them of being racist and it blows up their lives. There may have to be legislation built around that. So the question becomes, will the political will be there? And that depends on the people and it depends on the politicians. I know your lovely state here, California, just the state legislature just voted to take the anti-discrimination language out of the state constitution, which I think is a bold move. Um, I think the people get to decide on that in the end in maybe November. But What is the anti-discrimination language in um, the constitution that they're removing? Yeah, are you going to pull that one up? It's like Article 31 or something like that. It is unbelievable that they voted to, to put this up to be pulled out of the Constitution. What, what was their It's like you motivation? can't discriminate or favor by race, uh, gender, sex, sexual orientation, so on and so forth. Why would they remove that? Because equity requires discrimination. If you listen to this guy that's blasting all over, Ibram Kendi, the how to be anti-racist, he even has a sentence in the book where he says – that you have to evaluate everything according to whether it has racist or anti-racist outcomes. So if you have discrimination policy that says you cannot discriminate, and then that makes it so you don't have equity, then that's actually a racist policy. So they're actually advocating, I mean, equity requires- They're advocating discrimination? Correct, but it'll be positive discrimination. Well, it might actually discrimination be Discrimination against white males. It'll be discrimination Sorry. for at first. Discrimination for minorities, so the equivalent of affirmative action and reparations. And then they'll add in possibly discrimination against if they aren't achieving what they're trying to. And, and is this clear that this is their motivation? Is this? I mean, they're, they they don't lie about it. They just say it all the time. Is that if it's if you don't have equal outcomes, then the system must be. I mean, you can see how this is like putting like you know wallpaper over a hole in your wall. If yeah. the system has has unequal outcomes, it must be discrimination. So you're just gonna gonna change the policies to make up for it. 
And that, I mean, they say it explicitly. And you see this, there have been actually, a, there's a lawsuit, at least one lawsuit, one in New York City where they were openly discriminating against Asian students. Like they were, they were discriminating against Asians to make it because they're, you know, they're yes. academically kicking all the ass. And so they were making it more difficult for, they would have, have to have had a higher GPA right. to get in. Yeah. What, where's going, what's going on with that Harvard? There's a lawsuit with Harvard with that. Right. I don't know where it, where it's at though. Yeah, that is uh, that's troubling. This this is troubling stuff. Yeah. And, and I mean, I say California does this. I don't know what happens because it's in violation of the federal laws. So I mean, it's directly against the Title Seven. Who's, who's pushing for that? Uh, who's I mean, all of these kind of like hustlers that are getting all famous are pushing <sighs> for it. But then I, again, as your state legislature actually voted amongst themselves Jesus to put it up Christ. to a vote. Um, all the more reason to to move to Texas or something. <laughs> God, it's so spooky. It's like, where do they think this shit goes? It's like there's no map of the territory. There's no, like, uh, if we do this, then, you know, we're, we're going to have this kind of success in the future because, you know, we'll, we'll discriminate to the point where we reach some sort of homeostasis. I mean— Some equality. There's some, there are some scary— Judge ruled for Harvard. Wow. The thing Politically with, motivated lawsuit brought by Edward Blum, the organization he created, Students for the Fair Admissions, wants to remove the consideration of race in college and university admissions. What's at stake? The ability of colleges and universities across the country to create div the diverse communities essential to their educational missions and the success of their students. So the problem was that so many of these Asian kids were doing so well that they had a disproportionate number of Asian students and they wanted to balance it out better. They want more blacks and Latinos specifically. They usually say it, at least in New York City, they, they actually say it, mm. that it's blacks and Latinos. They say it over and over and over again, that, that Asians and whites and Jews are filling all the spots and mm. blacks and Latinos aren't. So what you're actually looking at is they're trying to move to a space where they can put racial quotas in. That's so crazy. And it, it hurts people, right? So if you take a, like with Harvard, Harvard's hard. It's a hard school. So if you take somebody who's academically not prepared for Harvard and you stick them in Harvard, they're going to underperform. Right. And then um, if you would have stuck them in a school that they actually are, you know, it, it matches their, their capabilities, then they're going to excel. That's how it works. You can't – like if, you're, if, if we went out into the gym and we, we put some weights on there, right, and you're like, all right, Jim, you're going to bench 400 pounds. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> but it's like – you know, you wanted to coach me, you would say, all right, we found out you can do like 190 or whatever, so we're going to push yourself, we're going to try 195. You know, within that little bit of a range, you can cause somebody to excel, and then within however many months or years, I'm benching three, 400 pounds. You, you can't just put people in hard mode and then watch them succeed. And then, again, I get these emails from people, they're telling me their story. I get this one from this black guy who said that he never had any of his work corrected. And how does he know in his master's program? How does he what? know? What? How does he know? In his He's, master's program? Yeah, so he started deliberately putting mistakes in to see if they'd correct it, and they wouldn't. They didn't correct it. Like, he was putting mistakes in on purpose, right? So he's getting A's on all these papers that he was writing that were just junk, and now he can't get a job because his skills never developed to the point where they're actually competitive. So it's like trying to help people by the wrong means hurts them. Well, they don't care about the end result, right? They don't care about you getting a job. They really just care about you graduating and it looking good on their... It's like I said, it's like putting wallpaper over a hole in the wall and considering mm -hmm. it fixed. It's like, oh, we're just going to fix the numbers on the back end and problem solved, you know. But if Harvard really wanted to make things equal, they would try to figure out why they're not based on, you know, what, like if they have only X amount of white people and X amount of Asian people. Like why, why are there less of this race exactly. or nationality than the other? Exactly. And let's, let's put some study into what can be done and use all these brilliant minds – to figure out what can be done to make this better. And I'll give you an, an analogy that helps you understand what systemic, say, racism or systemic, what this idea really means. So imagine, like, you and I go out for a walk down the sidewalk, right? And for whatever reason, you step on, you know, the back end of a broken bottle, and you trip, and you bump into me, and you knock me into the road when you trip, and I happen to get hit by a car, and I die. Okay, so whose fault was that? Obviously, usually we'd probably say it's like no fault or whatever. But if you start looking at it the way that these scholars do, and this is actually tracking the same argument that's in the book, Being White, Being Good, by Barbara Applebaum about white complicity. What happens is you could say, well, 
you it's your fault for tripping and it's my fault for deciding to walk on the street side versus the the inside and walking right next to you instead of slightly in front of you it's the person who drove the car's fault for you know maybe they were speeding maybe maybe they happened to have chose to go at that time maybe the doctor called and they had to run out of the house so the doctor's now got some complicity in in the, the situation the kid who broke the bottle last night after he had a couple of beers, well, it's his fault, so he's complicit. But then if you go all the way to this systemic understanding where you're just looking at the back end, the wallpaper over the hole in the wall, it would be saying, well, we live in a culture where people drive cars and drink beer. We live in a culture that supports cars and beer. Everybody that supports car culture, everybody who supports the economy that, that allows people to afford cars, everybody who supports the culture that would allow beer to exist is also somehow complicit. That's actually the same argument that the white complicity and racism book makes. Everybody, car culture is to blame for me getting hit by that car. And so you can see it makes it impossible to figure out where moral responsibility actually lies because it puts it on everybody. And it makes it impossible to see what the actual causes are. Another story I had uh, from similar to this was from University of Michigan. There's this program called Stride. And it's supposed to fix for these disparities. And so I'm talking to somebody, and he's talking about hiring, academic hiring. And he says, okay, um, the way the Stride, paper, the Stride program looks at it, for whatever reason, men have twice as many of this as women, whatever the thing is. And so Stride says, okay, so if a woman applies, you count the number. If a man and a woman apply, you count the number the man has, you double the number the women have. And I said, hang on a second, wait a minute. Do you know why that number is different? And he said, No. Nobody knows why it's different. It just is. So we're just going to double it. And I said, but some of that might be discrimination and some of it might not. And I would agree with you that we should consider making up for the part that is discrimination. So maybe it's half of that is discrimination. So you add of something, but you don't double it because some of it might be something different and you don't know. And he was like, well, what else could it be? Right? So this systemic thinking prevents you from being able to start thinking of what the real causes, the real problems are. Mm. So it's, again, it's fixing your, your hole in your wall by just like, oh, let's just put up some wallpaper, you know? But systemic thinking right now is very popular. It's so hot. It's everything. Yes. They love saying it, too, because it sounds good. And it's religious. I mean, it's a spiritual thing, right? Yeah. The, the, there's a system. It works in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does in a lot of ways. It works. I mean, this comes back to, if we look at the book, uh, Michel Foucault's philosophy, power and uh, politics work through everybody constantly by the way that we speak about things, by the way that we think about things. So you have this kind of like vague mystical sense of how society works is that it's operating through everybody and everybody's complicit and tied into it. Well, I don't have a problem with them being wrong. Me I don't either. have a problem with, but, but I do have a problem that this stuff can't be questioned. Right. And that if you even bring it up, you get insulted and, you know, you're probably going to get attacked now. That's right. You know what else I have a problem with is that they come in and they sell you something like anti-racism or diversity or inclusion or equity. And they don't tell you really what it means. It just sounds good. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's why I'm writing that encyclopedia. I, my, my opinion, you know, I am a firm believer that people should be able to believe what they want. They should be able to within not injuring people or whatever, you know, do what they want. You should really we should have freedom, a lot of freedom. And so I think that people, though, should be able to know what they're signing up for. Mm -hmm. And this language is so tricky. They've really engineered the language to be so tricky that people think, oh, anti-racism, that sounds really good, mm -hmm. so let's do it. And it actually, like the definition of it is a lifelong commitment to self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism. It's ongoing and, and no one has ever done. That's actually the definition. Isn't that kind of what's wrong with a lot of this woke shit is that we're, we're monkeying around with definitions and language. We're, we're changing. Right. We're changing language. Screw, right. We're screwing with what things actually mean to the point where everything gets very vague and confusing. And to challenge it, That's right. you're ostracized. That's right. Everything, like when you hear like, like Antifa talk about fascism. Like yeah. Everybody's a fascist. Everybody's sure. a Nazi now. What they actually, like if you dig in and figure out what the word fascism means, it actually means a functioning society because it has to have like police, it has to have order, it has to have, uh, you know, an economy that functions. It's, it means not anarchy because mm -hmm. anything that could lead to a total fascist state equals fascism in the present, according to the way they think about it. That comes again from that Herbert Marcuse guy who wrote this. They wrote it explicitly in um, Repressive Tolerance in 1965. We live in a perpetual state of emergency now that fascism has entered the world. So everything that could produce fascism is fascism. 